And now we're doing a genre swap um, with Paul McLean and Lisa Scottolini. So I know I'm speaking to people who are very familiar with these fabulous, fabulous authors. Um, you can find their full bios in the program, which is emailed to you and which we'll send around again in the wrap up. But just as a little refresher, Paula McLean, of course, is the New York Times bestselling author of novels such as Love and Ruin, Circling the Sun, and The Paris Wife. And Lisa Scottolini is the New York Times bestselling author and Edgar Award winning author of more than 30 novels. Um, and uh, we are so thrilled to talk about their next forays into um, literature with these very exciting books that you're going to hear a lot more about. So I'm thrilled to welcome to the stage. The stage. Let's let the virtual stage. Lisa and Paula, welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Look at Paula. Oh. Hi, Lisa. How are you? So exciting. We've become friends, and I loved her book. So this is just so cool to be together. Thank so. you. So that's just been such a gift that we were sent each other's books and have read them recently. Just have fallen in love. Essentially fallen in love online, but through exactly. our work. Exactly. I feel the same way. It's so nice. So thanks for having us, everybody. Thanks for all being here. Thank you for being here. Have you guys ever met in person before, or is this your first time meeting? No. I mean, I never no, go out. No, we there. clearly should have. We should have. <laughs> I, think the way, I think the way we met is great, because we met as true book lovers. Like, I read her book for this panel, and I just was like, this shows that genre is sort of a, I don't know if it's a convention or just packaging, because I've always loved her books. But I read, and I saw the soul of her books in this book, regardless of whether you call it suspense or psychological suspense. But I said it's crime fiction of the highest order, and it is, but it's also just a terrific novel. Thank, really you. Thank you. I would say the same thing, although there was a part of me that just was so kind of thrilled and blown away that you would just sort of like break that ceiling. I guess this is the year of the shattered glass ceiling, right? And just yeah, not well, be held in by by any sort of conventions except to tell a good story. I think that's really true. Sometimes I think that, you know, that book of Lean In meant something to me because I was, uh, it, there's a part she says, and I think particularly with respect to women, or maybe I'm just on the insecure side, but that it was, um, we we don't we always say we're not ready we're not ready and i had always wanted to write historical fiction and finally at some point i just said you know you're really not getting any younger <laughs> and you know, like maybe after like 30 odd books maybe you should just give it a shot and but i feel like you do it's it's great look life is about growth you hope yeah, yeah. did you is that is that what made you switch now no, I mean, so I'm hearing a difference. So this is something that you have always wanted to do, and you finally kind of um, forced yourself into giving it a shot. And, and for me, you know, I was, for the last 10 years, I've been writing these historical novels about, about women who actually lived. And I was actually in the middle of my last historical novel when this radical idea came to me like a bolt of light, you know, just like at, from completely out of nowhere and just knocked me sideways. I pictured this troubled detective who becomes obsessed with finding a vanished local girl. And I just saw the whole thing, you know, like when ideas come, right? It just, right. Boom, the whole thing came. I saw this setting. I saw the profound connection these characters had. I, I saw even minor characters and it all came through. And then what came alongside of it was pure mortal terror. It's like, <laughs> here's the idea, but what do I know about this right. What do I know about a crime novel? How would I follow these characters into this world? And and do I have the, you know, do I have the chops? And then do exactly. I have the courage to follow them where I know this story needs to go? Right. Yeah. It's so true. I felt some of that, too, because well, I felt all of that because a little bit. I think it was great. Courtney, you know, taking a leap. I am, um, you know, I've I, I've always written about justice and family, but I always sort of wanted to write a big, sweeping epic romance. And that's weird because, like, I haven't had a date in like 17 million years. You know? <laughs> I'm like four dogs and a cat. I'm kind of happy. But so I was like, can you 
can you get, I had to think about what was it when you first fell in love and what was it like? And I, cause I wanted to just be transported when I wrote it. And I kind of was, it's, as you say, it's these three best friends and they're in Rome and fascism's coming and trying to look at those law and justice, but above all to look at just real love between this woman and these two guys who happen to be best friends, all of them. And you're like, you know, your heart's in your, I don't know, do you outline? Cause I don't. So I was like, Oh my God, are you going to be able to do this? Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> I love that. Sorry, Jennifer, maybe you're not no. going to get a word in edgewise no, here sorry. because we're just like <laughs> girlfriends at a kind of wine exactly gathering. What no. everyone wants to hear, I just want to make sure everyone knows the names of your upcoming books. Oh, because oh. We just <laughs> dove right in. So let's um, just take right. a moment because we've already learned so much and you've already answered some of my initial questions that I had. But um, Paula, do you want to tell them the title of your upcoming novel? <laughs> sure. I was going to hold up Lisa's book. Actually, I was hold up my is, this is like our secret Sam all over. I know. My galleys arrived um, a few weeks ago, and I promptly gave them all away. But the title is When the Stars Go Dark, and it's out April 13th. So, And Lisa, your book is called? Well, my book is called Eternal, but here I happen to have a album <laughs> when the stars go dark, which I just, just loved. And uh, oh, it's, it's just, it's just so great to be here together. I'm sorry, because you had set a conversation, although you guys set the tone when you did that Secret Santa. I was weeping, <laughs> weeping. <laughs> the estrogen is flowing like wine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like to keep it flowing. You know, we, we all hopefully have Kleenex just in case. But I do want to say, I mean, of course, everybody watching knows you for, you know, you've all written so many things. I mean, I know that in addition to historical fiction, Paula, you've written memoir, you've written poetry. Lisa, you are perhaps best known and loved for your, your thrillers and suspense, but you've also have a following as a humor writer and you do wonderful, you know, essays with your daughter. And so, I wonder, like, do you do you guys feel the leap? I mean, you must know how it seems that this is a genre swap of sorts for perhaps what you're best known for. But does it feel that way? Do you does it feel like a big change and a big leap in many ways? You want to go first, Paula? <laughs> sure. Yeah, it does. It does feel like a radical leap, and I think there is a part of me that must kind of love doing that occasionally, like throwing myself off a cliff into this unknown, unknowable territory because I did it 10 years ago with The Parish Wife. I had this idea that literally, same, same, came from absolutely nowhere. I'd never written historical fiction. It had never occurred to me to write about a person who actually lived. But the idea had heat and integrity. And that's when I know, you know, you have that spidey sense and you know an idea is big and that it could change you. So there's fear and there's opportunity. And to me, those two things kind of go together. There's an opportunity to challenge yourself, to grow as a writer. If we continue to tread the same territory, I'm not saying that we don't, we can't still grow, but there's something kind of thrilling that happens when it's like no off the edge of the cliff, no net. That's really wow. true. And you can see it when she smiles. And I felt the same way because it was, I, I had really, you know, there's things like Casablanca. I'd always loved the kind of big love story, like epic love story against a wartime thing. Like all of that mix and also loving the sort of issue of when, what's the, sh when does law not lead to justice? When is law in fact unjust? And when I took, was it an undergrad at Penn, um, I had a course with Phil Roth, which I still can't believe I was in. <laughs> and he taught us about Primo Levi and the Italian Holocaust. And I'm like Italian-American, and I'm like big time identifying with it. And I thought, how did I not even know about the Holocaust in Italy? So I thought, when you're ready to write this, this will be, a, this is so much bigger. But and I love everything I write, but the thrill of trying something completely different. Like, for example, you still have to, because I'm like, what is historical fiction? Well, I guess it's history, but it's still fiction, and you have to make the characters real. So I have a young woman, Elizabetta, who's the protagonist, and I thought back to my own life. I'm like, what is it like when you get your first bra? What's that like? You know, and I gave her my experience, which is that mean girls came up to me and said, you need a bra, and I was a tomboy, and I cried, and my mother took me out, and she doesn't have a great mom, so it's a different experience. But that idea of, like, 
just very female. And I thought I haven't read this because we don't, we still don't tell enough stories about women. And so it was sort of interesting to go back in the 1930s Rome and do all the history and do all the research and figure out what did they make bras out of? Turns out they made them themselves if they could. And <laughs> that set me off a whole thing. I said, this is very cool. Like, wow. you never did this before. And it got me jazzed. Like, I felt just like Paula. Like, thr- I felt thrilled. I feel wow. thrilled. Did, did either of you ever feel like this wasn't something you would have the chance to venture into? <laughs> Do you feel like you're being typecast, so to speak, before? And, and is this something you never thought would happen? Or did you always know, like, this book would come to be at some point for you? Well, honestly, I was so nervous about letting my editor and my publishing team know I had this idea that I forced myself to finish. I think it was three drafts before I I even tipped my hand. I mean, they knew I was doing something kind of on the sly because otherwise I would have, you know, tried to get a contract. (laughs) So there I was sort of like, you know, just in the trenches, like in the salt mines, doing my work. And I had one voice saying, what if you can't do it? Like, what if you can't finish? That's also, I mean, I'm a big underdog. I don't know about you, Lisa. Like, there's something about if you just, you tell me I can't do it, then that and will be enough rocket fuel to get me there. So. so true. And it's a little bit like, for my case, you know, of course, look, you know, some people say they don't read their reviews. I re- I memorize my reviews. I, I'm <laughs> checking that. I hope all these librarians going, listen, you guys, get our things off NetGalley. You get it free. Read it when you get the time, both of our books. But I was, I, I had not really understood what a leap it was until these reviews start to come in, and though they're wonderful, they all begin with, she's known for legal thrillers, and to, like, we're just ladies in the suburbs, and, you know, I'm like, I'm inside me, so I don't really, I write humor um, every, I've been writing it for 12 years for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and in these books that libraries have been so supportive of. Uh, so to me, it's not so it was what is harder to me that it was I wanted it to be an epic. I wanted it to be on a bigger for example, all of my novels take about four days in this in the story. This is twenty years. I've never done that in my life. So this that it was a whole nother level, as I like to say, was harder for me because I think when you're in, when you're the writer, it doesn't feel so different. And I think when I read your your this you know, when the stars go dark, I don't even want to say suspense novel. I think it's a terrific novel that moves super fast, but also goes really deep into the character, why she is the way she is. Why does she go back to her hometown? What does she find there and how does it relate to her past? That's just a hell of a good story. And right. that's our job and aren't we lucky to have it. And the same yeah. rules apply, right? The same yeah. rules apply no matter, right? You still have to write a good scene. You still, it still has to be believable. There still has to be integrity, right? You still right. have to move the plot. Like all of these things still apply. So I don't know. I don't know. I just really was really touched by what you were saying about the, the love story, you know, wanting to, to throw yourself into a love story that's like that, you know, the kind that songs are written about it. And it does strike me sometimes that we live out in our characters what we don't live out in our lives. Right. I mean, it's sadly true. I'm so tempted to go get my car. That's what your readers do, too, which is why it's so meaningful, right? So, <laughs> Where did she go? Here's where I am. I went to get Bradley Cooper. <laughs> this is so wild and, and unliterary. But I, will, I have a car cut out. We watched the Super Bowl together. But I will tell you that because yeah, look, I'm divorced twice, but I started to think, what was it like when you could, like, remember when you really wanted them, like, to get a letter? I remember writing letters to somebody at 16. <laughs> or just, you know, that newness and that aliveness and what am I about now? And what's cool about it, for you, it's sort of telling for this time period and that, you know, a woman's life is long, if you're lucky. And you you have these stages. And you all have lived through them if you're lucky. And, God, we're living through one now, aren't we? And those things occasion a personal growth, and they happen, you know, you can have an, I call it an identity crisis, but you can also call it just a personal growth at any period. I think I grew, I grew enough to write this book, and I grew because I wrote it. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. It's oh, the I magic of books, really. It's just the magic of this business, of what we do. Right. It's true. And, and you start your book 
I mean, I don't know if you relate to what you just said, but it reminds me, you said, let everyone then have the right to tell his story in his own way, which is a quote from Ignacio Salone. Yeah, I don't want to say it yeah, correctly. Exactly. Right? Yeah, and I but, but that reminds me a little bit about how you feel. I mean, obviously, that was chosen with <laughs> care. And then your opening, Paula, was, you know, here's the world, beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. So I feel like you both, <laughs> I'm just, underst you know, I mean, it's really wonderful to hear in your own words why those are how you begin your book. Don't worry, I won't give any spoilers away. I know, <laughs> but, um, I, felt, I felt like I could share those quotes, but thank you. And, you know, Paula, you talked about that voice that you hear. So is that, you know, voice of like, can I do this? Is that something that doesn't happen as much in historical fiction anymore? Or for you, Lisa, not so much in, in something that feels more familiar? Does that voice subside after a lot of success and this felt different? Um, I don't think the voice ever goes away. I think it's really important to keep humility um, kind of in your pocket as you're going along, because you can always be schooled by the blank page for sure, or by any scene, you know, you wake up those days and it's like, I've never written dialogue before. I don't know what people say to each other. Um, but to me, surprise is the reason to keep doing this. I'm a huge believer in the subconscious and in dreams that our subconscious is our, the most interesting thing about us. And so for me, the, the great surprise of this book, how I had these aha moments all the way along, I'll just say one quickly, not to take your airspace, Lisa. So the research, research is such a huge part of my work as a historical novelist. And there, uh, I just, it's just, it's, it's more fun than I can ever kind of possibly explain to you. So I knew I was going to have to do a bunch of research to kind of get my feet under me. And I wanted to set the book um, before DNA, before cell phones, before, before, before the Internet, before people started watching CSI obsessively and thinking they could solve a murder with their laptops from like blood spatter patterns, right? So... I set the book in 1993, and as soon as I did that, this kind of extraordinary thing happened where I learned that there were a string of real-life um, abductions that happened in the same time frame and in the same geographical area that I was exploring, and it really unsettled me. It was really it's like this moment where I realized, like, I'm telling a story, but I'm not just telling a story, right? My imaginary girl is in grave danger, but real families have been struck, you know, to the core by moments like this. And it gave a level of gravitas to my work and kind of changed the intentions for my book when that happened. It's like that was the moment that I decided to include cases of real life victims um, because I wanted the book to be honest about it. And it occurred to me that saying their names was sort of a sacred act. It was to honor their lives and to dignify their death. So it was, it was amazing. Wow. I absolutely understand that, and I felt the same way, and I felt it when I've written about, certainly in crime fiction, but in, in Eternal especially, too, because uh, I don't want to give anything away, but it's a, so it's about the rise of fascism and how the law has actually begun to oppress people, Jews in particular, and everyone comes under this horrifying uh, thrall of this regime. But there's an event that I learned about that took place in Rome, and I've been to Rome plenty of times, and everyone's like, oh, go here, have the artichokes, go to the Jewish ghetto, like, it's, the food's great. And I'm like, wait a minute. Then I started to learn about an event that actually occurred there, and that people don't know about it, and 1,500 people just whiffed away. And then you say, well, it's exactly what you said. You're honoring, you're honoring that event. And and that's true whether you're writing about one murder or you're writing about the Italian Holocaust at large. You have to make it real in a way that – and personal. And it's all of the same – it's really the same things you do in any novel I've written before. Um, but I – but I to, and I totally agree with you. There's something about the true life element of it that 
yeah. commands you like attention must be paid kind of thing. And that, mm-hmm. but I love that. I love that about your book. And I love that about writing that. And I love that about readers because I think readers, librarians know this in space. You know, when you have some historically true event, I've always sort of thought that people respond to truth, whether it's emotional truth in novels or literal truth. And when there's a historic truth, that is something like when I did the research for this, I talked to one of the, um, at the at Italian Jewish kind of museum. And I said, why was there no, why wasn't this brought up at Nuremberg? And he said, nobody wanted another Nuremberg. And as soon as he said that, I was pissed. I was like, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to have this as an underpinning to this novel to do it justice, which is kind of, in a way, what we both do in these novels, I think, if I can say so. You know, you tell the, you can't get justice for these victims, but you can tell their story. Mm-hmm. And you can let people know their story. And I knew I would write about this because it was a story that needed to be told. Not the fiction wrapping per se, but the underpinning. Right. To right. respond to truth, which is what's so wonderful about people. Honestly. And I think that, that the one of the jobs of the writer is to bear witness. Yeah. That's one of the reasons we're here. Which I didn't think before I wrote this book, did you? Um, I think I've always sort of believed that if a if a story also has a social conscience without being heavy handed, as long as we're also being swept into a story that we believe and falling in love with characters who we identify with. Um yeah. Yeah. I, Mm-hmm. I think the only thing I thought close to that is because I've written so much about women and sort of got known for kind of strong, independent characters like yours, that mm-hmm. that that we still need more stories about us, and yeah. we and there isn't enough, and we still in the culture look for that. So to a certain extent, we bear that witness. I always think of it as shining a spotlight on ordinary people uh, who are just go, undergoing travails, like all of us now. Or like an eternal, you know, live through a world war, go through starvation. Or like your detective Anna Hart is, you know, she's going to plumb the depths of her childhood and put herself in moral danger. And we are, all of us, have some struggle. We all have some struggle. And we need, I always feel that I need a little pep talk to overcome. I think, you know, these books are that. There's triumph. Yeah. Wow. And I love hearing, I mean, it's so fascinating. That was one of my questions about research, which you already answered for me. But I mean, you know, that the approach, because your job as a storyteller isn't really different, regardless of genre or, or whatever people want to call it. So I think that's so fascinating that it didn't really change that much of your approach. Um, and you, you've mentioned a little bit with these personal connections you have. And I know you both include um, author's notes as part of your books, which obviously was very important to you to explain your personal connections to these stories. Without giving too much away, do you want to speak a little bit um, to, to why that was important to include for you and what perhaps your personal connection was that made you begin this journey? Yeah, absolutely. And so it was a kind of rabbit hole, and I really, my ears perked up when I listened to Lisa say, you know, with her character, Elizabeth, uh, you know, she gave her some of her experiences, like a bra for the first time or, you know, getting a love letter, et cetera. So when I had the um, aha moment with my research and I decided to make this decision, you know, to include real life characters, it almost opened the door that I hadn't opened before, which was it occurred to me that I could give Anna Hart, my detective, some of my experiences, like my actual experiences. I grew up in foster care, for instance. So then Anna became a character who grew up in foster care and who was carrying a load, a psychic load that was very much like some of what I carry. And I've given her a version of my family story. I've given her my fascination with trauma and healing, sort of my deep interest in intimate violence and the repercussions of that and it's just at a certain point I decided to give her everything. Wow. That must be scary to do. Do you ever feel like, well, people are gonna know all these personal things about me or do you feel it's you know, it's a disguising character? Is it is it a scary thing to do? Yeah. Yeah. It's mind bogglingly scary. And yet it's also there's a kind of um 
I want to say, like a reckoning that happens, though. What Lisa said earlier, like, attention must be paid. And sometimes that voice gets really loud, like, maybe it's time to stand up and tell these truths. The world is a complicated place, and it's getting more complicated by the moment. Like, I'm not serving myself or any of my readers by pulling punches, right? Like, maybe maybe it's time. And the stories are difficult, and it did make me feel... Um, exposed, I guess, on a certain level, but we're always exposing ourselves as writers, whether we're <laughs> doing it intentionally or not, we are always telling truths about ourselves on the page. Right, that's absolutely true. And Barbara King Solver has a great, great quote where she's like, if you want to know me, read my books. Like, you really have someone's soul. And I felt that way, too, in this with... um. With so much about, like, for example, there were little nuggets that I found where there's an inspiring story of a, I don't want want to give it away, but an entire hospital that moved to save a lot of Jewish families, which I was so moved by at great risk. And I think sort of the beating heart that's exposed for me, and I think a little bit, I think about my mother a lot in my humor, these columns, I put them up on Facebook, every, every Sunday they're up there. A lot of them, I noticed more and more they're about my mother, and I lost her a couple of years ago now. But I think she had such humor, and she, in the face of hardship, I always say that she was one of 19 children because that just, to me, encompasses it. She was the youngest of 19. And her soul, but she was the funniest person on the planet, and she was here in hospice, and her... At the end, she would write on a sheet because she her throat failed her, but she her own, essentially her last words were, "Who needs it?" You know, she gets, <laughs> and I was like, "That is so frigging profound." And that humor that she had, she always answered a question with this question. Like I would say, "How you doing, Ma?" She said, "Who wants to know?" And that sharp older woman, you know, I had a great mother. She was a great mother. But this character does not have a great mother. And that unconditional love was so important to me. And I was so lucky that I just was like, I want to give this girl something. She's completely on her own. And she will be so strong, therefore. But she finds sort of a surrogate mom. And that person is the soul of my mother. And truly, I didn't even realize it. It sounds crazy, but I mean, I really didn't realize it when I was writing it until I realized that Elisabetta stands with the woman in the kitchen because they both love to make pasta. And my mother used to make pasta every Sunday. And I realized I know how to make homemade gnocchi because, believe me, I don't do it that much. But it's only because I watched her. And so the person who teaches you how to make something is could be your person. And that's her person. And and I want it, and I, it's just funny how writing stuff exposes stuff for you and to others. And in a way, it's thrilling and also scary, but essential, essential. Yeah, yeah. When I, when the humor stuff, I always say, if it doesn't make me cringe, it won't make you laugh. <laughs> I always think of the joke, you know, like if I, you know, when I first wrote about having a gray chin hair and realized you know, I was turning into an Amish man. You know, like, you know, I pl- I have to say that out loud. I plucked for this. I plucked for this platform because I knew that you would see me and people could see and you don't want them to see. And you have to really go. Th- don't you, Paul? You have to. I mean, your experience is so different and, and difficult. But you have to go there, man, to make it real. You cannot do it if it's not real. Right. right. That's the amazing thing. Those intimate details that you share that seem so specific is what opens it up to everybody to jump yeah. in. I think we're talking about risk-taking. I mean, from the beginning of this panel, we've been talking about about risk-taking. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, I like that genre swap should change to a game of risk. <laughs> There's also <laughs> <Lisa> <laughs> Ray Brown territory, baby, and we need it. Yeah, vulnerability. <laughs> Talk about yeah. vulnerability. Right. Especially women, because I don't think we're always taught to take risk. You know, I always took comfort, this is embarrassing to say, from that uh, Mindy Kaling book when she says, why not me? That's yeah. perfect, you know, why not? Yeah, yeah, you can try to write this. And Paul and I have been emailing each other. Hey, you know, we're we're not so bad. We're encouraging each other. I loved your book. You loved mine. Yeah. And it's a great thing, too, the girlfriends. I mean, God, we saw a great example of it in you guys with your secret Santas. I mean, <laughs> we're and librarians do it so well. You know, we girlfriends, we need each other. We just need each other, and we're lucky in each other. We're blessed in yeah. each other. 
I think there's something to be said, too, if we're going to go right to Brene Brown territory, um, <laughs> to give yourself permission whether or not the, the universe is giving it to you or, right, some figure right. of authority is giving it to you. And to right. answer those questions for yourself, if you had this burning desire, right, to write this book, then you write it. Right. You don't wait around for somebody to tell you you can Exactly. Yeah. And it's true. People who are listening might just want to write themselves. I mean, I know that people think about it. I always, I also channeled Hugh Jackman and Stephen Sondheim just surprised me, but Hugh Jackman sings a song about give it a go. And it's just this Australian attitude of just give it a go. Just give it a well, go. Well, all librarians are writers. We know that, right? Secret, <laughs> that, secret writers for sure. Go for it. Go for well, it. Since we've, we've come to our lovely audience of librarians, I am curious to ask you because I know you both have made no secret about your love for libraries over the years. And I've been in library marketing a long time and have, you know, always appreciated how you have, you know, visited ALA and spoken to librarians. So let's take a moment for our audience here. Do you each want to share just what what is it for you that has given you such an intimate library connection and why is it so important for you to connect with libraries? Well, from the beginning, libraries were my were my home and my safe space. I grew up in this very dislocated way in foster care, and so any time I went to a new school, I, you know, instead of trying to make friends, I would make friends with librarians, and I would eat my lunch at the library, and I would read two and three books a day, and that was my place. Like, that was my safe place, and it still is, as you all know. Um, that we find our way to the library when we need to feel a sense of safety and belonging. And and I also didn't know along the way that I was teaching myself to become a writer, too, by plunging deeply into other people's stories and worlds and imagining different stories for myself. So it's a life changer. It's a game changer. I owe such a debt of gratitude to libraries and librarians. So thank you. Yes, I, I feel the same way. I mean, my mother used to hate when I told this, but there was one book in my house, and the book was TV Guide. We did not grow up. There was not, there were not, there were no books. And it wasn't until the school librarian actually called my parents in and said, you know, you should take her to the library. And they were like, why? There's no TV. But in any event, <laughs> I, I was in the library, and my dad waited in the car like a dog. I mean, but I, God bless him, because at least I got to be and choosing the books and I, it just, it was a world, it was an escape, and I really felt like, um, I felt like it was, there was something about my library card that I always remember and I still have, and I think it's because it felt like membership to me, like, this, like my parents loved me deeply, but they didn't really get me, per se. They, my mother was always like, stop reading, you'll ruin your eyes. I mean, really, her whole life, she never got it, <laughs> but, no, but, but the, at the library, that was where I belonged. And I still felt that way. And, it, and you know, I was, was broke for so long, for 10 years before I became a writer and trying to get published and was in the library all the time. And they just were always there for me and my daughter. And I owe them just as a citizen of this country. I think libraries are just foundational to democracy. And uh, they know I love them. And um, it's heartfelt. It just is. We, owe, we all owe them a debt. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Well. Now we're all creepy. <laughs> you guys started it. <laughs> and actually, it's funny because I said that's the perfect segue in my head. I said to go to um, our, our wonderful listeners who are watching and writing in all these librarians and the comments. I mean, I think you are making people weepy. <laughs> I wanted to see if anyone had any questions in particular since we have a few minutes left. Um, Lisa, some people want to know if your dogs are around. <laughs> so you, you remember having a, a very cute... Proof they are all, thank you for asking. They're all in my bedroom because I cannot trust them. I'm like, this is mommy's big gig. Don't embarrass her with Paula and Jennifer. <laughs> and there's a lot of intrigue about, because you're both in front of some beautiful, beautiful bookshelves. No surprise. There's People are very curious about what's on your shelves, but I don't know if you want to keep them in suspense, but <laughs> it does look like beautiful backdrop for in this conversation. <laughs> Certainly, this is my, you know, for show. I'm actually on my treadmill. If you want to see no me. No way. Really? <laughs> are, you, are you exercising during this interview? Watch. <laughs> I, mean, I have a treadmill desk. I have a treadmill desk. Oh, wow. It's 
and my Nancy Drew collection. So that's my oh. special bookshelf. Perfect. Oh, yours, yours looks much classier than mine. <laughs> well, you know, this is my, this is what happened this year. I recently moved and the first thing that happened is I designed the, the bookcase, which fits uh, about half my book. So it actually stretches wall to wall and floor to ceiling. And I'm actually having a library ladder made that roll along a, right? Is that pornography or what? Right? The rolling <laughs> library ladder. That's 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 everyone's face. dream. I'm seeing the like meme of Belle in the bookshop. <laughs> Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. That's what you're going to actually share. We'll have to share a photo of that when you get that installed so we can all dream of <laughs> drool. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, well, well, thank you all so much. Is there anything I didn't ask that you're like, oh, wait, I wish I could say this or that or anything additional you wanted to add that we didn't get a chance to talk about? I might add that I'm talking about Eternal every Tuesday night on Facebook Live, some aspect about the book. So join us at 730. I should say that. You, you know, and I should have brought that up. I feel like I know you even though I don't because I've been watching your videos. <laughs> And you even have a typewriter from one of your characters? I just, I don't, I just like, I'm actually really lonely, and it's just fun to do this again. <laughs> Polly, you got to come. Polly, you and I will Zoom another time. Sure. That sounds great. I'll hold your book up again. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> um, a true genre swap. Feel the author really love. <laughs> Thank, thank you, you so Jennifer. Much. You are so lovely. You really are. And everyone is. And thank you all for doing this and everybody who came. And Paula, you're you're amazing. You're a guy. I and thank you. I feel like this is just a real gift becoming friends. So, Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Stay thank well. you. It was a gift for all of us to get to sit in and chat with you. Oh, thank you. I love you guys. <laughs>